you remember the show Car 54? Where are you? Where are you? Yeah, you. I think you were on mute for part of that, which is better for everyone else. Car 54, <laughs> where are you? Ooh, ooh, we got a call. Ooh, we got to go. Yeah, so I vaguely remember the show that... So I used to get up early, Dad, when we lived in Florida, like five in the morning, and they would show... Nickelodeon would show all of those old black and white shows, like Mr. Ed and Car 54. I and, am Mr. Ed. A horse is a horse, of course, of course. But no one can talk to No one is tuning in for this reason. All right. That, all right that's it. That's a, singing is a, is a different podcast, not not this one. Mm. But I bring up Car 54, where are you? One, because it was your era, this baby boomer era. And where where are where have all the baby boomers gone? <laughs> like, this is not a really good segue, but it was the best I could think of in the moment. Um, so there there you go. Um, and another another poor segue here. Let's just jump right to our sponsor, <laughs> who we love, absolutely love. Uh, Tyndale is sponsoring today's episode. And I want to tell you about their life application study Bible. Um, this thing is jam packed full of great resources for you. And Tyndale does a lot of Bibles well, and particularly I love the New Living Translation. But this life application study Bible, really it, what it does is it helps you apply the scripture and it helps you live out your faith. And it's one of these Bibles that you can purchase now and you can use it the rest of your life. Um, exactly. And so it's, it's for life. It's for your life and for life. <laughs> it's, you know, if we're talking, you know, this is for me right now and I can use it for the rest of my life. So and there's a reason uh, it's one of the most popular study Bibles in history. I mean, it, I don't know the sales number. I haven't even ever asked Tyndale that, but I know it is off the charts. No, it's on the charts. It is on the charts. One of the best selling Bibles ever. Yeah. I mean, it, it's got great scholarship. It's got great application. This is one of the most complete study Bibles that has ever been done. So uh, we certainly want to thank Tyndale for sponsoring this episode. It's one of the reasons that we're able to provide free content. Um, but you really should go pick up this Life Application Study Bible. You can get it at lifeapplication.com. Again, lifeapplication.com. We've also got a link in the show notes. Um, man, it's a great gift. Christmas is right around the corner. This is what you, this is what you need to be buying for Christmas gifts. And get this Life what? Application Study Bible. You can tell that this... The study Bible has endured through the through the years. I mean, think about the domain lifeapplication dot com that they grabbed way back then. What a great domain! No, I'm kind of they. Tyndale does have good domains. They, they get do. those things early. I don't know how they do it, but yeah, lifeapplication dot com. It is. I, I wish I owned it. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, let's talk about the baby boomers. You are one. I am not. Um, and you know this this is uh, this episode is really based on. Some research by Ryan Burge, one of our researchers and a well-known researcher. Um, we, he does contract work for us. He doesn't only work for us, uh, but we're glad to have him doing research for us. And uh, I encourage you to go check out his stuff at graphsaboutreligion.com. Uh, like everyone's signing up for this now, Dad. I feel I think I think because of us, he is getting more subscribers. At a, he's getting subscribers at a faster rate than we, than we are. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's his content getting, is so we good. We have referred, he, he says every time we talk about him, it goes tick, 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 tick. It just keeps on going. We love that we can do that. And, indeed. It's good stuff. So graphs about religion. Want to give credit where credit is due. Ryan Burge has done a lot of this research, and you can find it there at his site. Um, but he calls it the silver tsunami, which is just a really good term. Um, you know, there's baby boomers that are... Many are retired or retiring, mm -hmm. and soon, it's a bit of a morbid thought, they, they will they will not be here anymore. Well, number of, number of them have already left too. You you want to know how to really get under the skin of a baby boomer? Is <laughs> this is horrible? I, I'm listening. Yeah. So you know, whenever you're in a public setting. And just treat them as if they're elderly, you know, like an elderly, you would treat an elderly person. Oh, sir, and, can I can take your arm and help you? <laughs> they, yes, yes, ex that's a good one. That is a really, oh, they hate that. They hate that. Uh, but anyway, uh, we, I, I should, Our generation I has things. always had a narcissism about ourselves. And, and when you start telling us we're old, it's like, no, we're not. We'll never be old. E even when we're dead, we won't be old. And we, we still think of ourselves at 
in the sixties at Woodstock, even if we were never close to New York. We, that's how we think of ourselves. Well, there's a lot of good with the generation. Um, and you know, baby boomers have done a lot of good for the church as part of the reason we're talking about them on this episode, but the average age of a church goer right now is 60 years old. So on the, I mean, that 60 would be a baby boomer. Like that would be the youngest of the the baby boomers right Almost. around there. Almost. Yeah. yeah all, 58, 59, I think is kind of where the cutoff is a current age. But point is, um, the church, the church in general is older in the United States. Part of the reason is the United States is just getting older in general. Um, and therefore the church is, but the average age of, or the median age of a church goer being 60 is still well above the median age of, uh, the typical American, which is 38, 39 years old. I would say that's way above. Yeah. Demographically, it is way above, certainly. I mean, you're talking about a whole, whole generation there. Um, so for a lot of churches, it's not quite crisis mode when it comes to the aging of your congregation, but it will be soon. And if you want to get ahead of the curve, well, you should, I mean, you really should begin now. Um, so what Ryan's done is he's put together some percentages. And again, these will be in the show notes if you're listening um, and don't have access to this. But among weekly churchgoers, boomers account for 36%. Gen X accounts for 24%. And millennials are 19%. So 36 boomer, 24 Gen X, and the millennials are 19%. That's actually a pretty good mix. And if that's um, where you are as a church, I would say that's a decent, that's a decent mix. Um, but even in a church like that, I would say you probably still need to get younger. Um, that of course, you're, you're not have matching the, gen, the community. He doesn't have the Gen Z number, but we know that the Gen Z number is going to even be lower. Correct. Each successive generation is lower. So those born after the millennials, say after what, 1981, something like that, uh, the, the, their frequency of coming to church is much less, if at all. Yes. Um, although there are some initial stats and boy, it's too early to tell. Uh, but some of the initial stats point to Gen Z being more active in the church at their current age than millennials were. So I can believe that. Just did the re just did a lot of research on them on a book that I have coming out in 2025 called uh, "The Anxious Generation Goes to Church," based upon the book "The Anxious Generation," and uh, a lot of research in that direction saying that Gen Z is looking for truth, they're looking for hope, they're looking for possibilities. So I think you're dead on there. And it's a, it's a hopeful and kind generation. The millennials were really angsty along with Gen X. Um, Gen X would say they started it and then millennials kind of took it to the next level. Um, but in, in Gen Z, there's just a kind of, a, one of the positive things about Gen Z is they're, they're just kind. And I've seen it in our own student ministry. Dad, our student ministry has almost doubled in like the last six months. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, part of that is because our church is in growth mode and families are coming but we are attracting Gen Z uh, at a faster rate than millennials now. Um, and, so, you're, yeah, and you're attracting them across ethnic groups as well. It's not just the white kids coming in. Well, that's part of the problem is if you're, if you're a white only church in a diverse community, and so I want to clarify if you're like, well, our community is 95% white. Well, that's fine. It's not a problem, but if you know you're a white only church in a community that's like ours that's 55% white and that portion is declining um you have to draw in people of different ethnicities just to honestly just to survive in the long term mm -hmm. uh, because you're you know you're, you're you're not reaching the community in the way that you should and again i'm not claiming racism or anything like that i you know i don't want to go down that road i'm i'm just saying you should reach the people of your community. And if you reach the people of your community, then your church will, will reflect the diversity of your community, whatever it is. Um, whether you be an all black church an all white church or whatever, um, we all should be about reaching everyone that's in our neighborhood. Um, so that is part of the problem is you're seeing the, the, the youngest generation is the most diverse generation. And if you're only doing ministry that kind of draws in the white population, you're, you're missing out on a huge segment of people of, of what could be your growth curve. And in the meantime, we have seen a dramatic decrease in median worship attendance. 
120 to the, uh, to the most recent that we verified is 65, even though anecdotally, I think it'll be around 55 when the 2025 number comes out. But the point is, if these generations are accounting for a decreasing percentage of the total attendance, that means our attendance is going to get smaller. That means our churches are going to get smaller. They already are getting smaller. I mean, 65 as a median, and I really think it's more around 55 is the median size church. 50% of churches are 55 and under in worship average attendance. They are getting smaller. Yeah. Now, I want to be clear. A church of 65 can still do a lot of good. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it depends on momentum, right? So if you were 30 and now you're 65, that's really good momentum. I mean, you're doing really well. If you were 300 and now you're 65, that's a problem. Uh, so it's not so much the size of the church as it is the direction of the church. But what we can't deny on a macro scale is what was churches of 120, 130, 140, 150 are now churches of 50, 60, and 70. Right. And that trend is across the board, everywhere in North America, it is a major problem. And there are a boatload of churches, that's the technical term, Dad, boatload, boatload. of churches mm -hmm. that are, we've got 75 people and they're all baby boomers. I mean, there are, or, or you know, maybe a, a smattering of their parents are there too. Builders. Um, builders, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, the builder generation, just the ones oh. that are around can't get out as much anymore. But um, but there are plenty of baby boomer churches. Now, I still think that there's a lot of potential there. And I still think that if any generation can be like, well, we're just going to throw convention to the wind and just go do it. I hope that it's the baby boomer generation. That's what the you ones guys are, are known for. Yeah. Well, in, in the meantime, you have mega churches that as a rule were built on the backs of baby boomer attendance. And now those mega churches are going to see a precipitous decline because proportionately those mega churches tend to have more boomers than other churches. Yes. This is like this um, unknown uh, factoid uh, is that the, Mega church, and this is something we've been talking about for quite some time. It's something I wrote about in my book, The, the Surprising Return of the Neighborhood Church. Oh, put that is, in the show notes. I love that book. I yeah, love that. Yeah. It, it's of the books I've written, it's it's my favorite. Um, it's not I like my best selling. revitalization checklist, too, though. Church revitalization checklist is another. That's my best selling. Uh, but my favorite is The Surprising Return of the Neighborhood Church. And it's something I write about there that. You know, it's, it's this thing that people don't realize that megachurches grew as a baby boomer phenomenon and they're filled with baby boomers. Yes, they have a lot of young people, of course. That's because they're huge and proportionally they're going to have some. But the, the churches that actually stand to decline the fastest and that decline actually hurt the church are these megachurches that are filled with baby boomers. And that's a lot of them. I mean, there's probably around a thousand megachurches in the United States right now. And we define megachurches being weekly average attendance above 2,000, 2,000 right. or above. This is probably, and it's really tough to know, but there's probably around 1,000 of them. If you go look at those 1,000 churches, what you're going to find is a whole lot of baby boomers there. That won't be all of them, but many of them, that's the case. So if, if you are in a large church that is built on a large church model and the biggest chunk of your people are retirement age, I mean, it's 10 years away, probably, of like these things truly collapsing in on themselves. But unless megachurches really get younger faster, and there's no trend that shows that they will, they're going to really struggle in the future. Uh, and Sam, I, I would say this, overall megachurches are declining per church attendance. Um, I don't have enough precision to say that, that I can just give you the data and we know it because it's hard to get a lot of the megachurch data. But based upon what we know, the decline has already started. Now, you're talking about the collapse where they're going Correct. to be near closing or they cannot support their facilities anymore. But we've been watching the decline for some time. Well, yeah, we know that they're all declining because the number of megachurches peaked in like 2012 at right around 1,700. And that's, those are approximate numbers. But And now we're right around 1,000. So clearly they're in decline. I mean, these churches that were once mega churches no longer are. Right. So we know they're declining and this the numbers are down by a significant, you know, portion. 
So yeah, we know that mega churches are in decline, and some people will say, "Well, I know this one mega church, and it's booming," and that that will always be the case. There's always going to be a large church that's booming, but um, my concern for large churches, and specifically mega churches, is if you are filled with boomers and you're relying on boomers for attendance and giving, well, that's not a really good model for the next fifteen years, <laughs> and that is a lot of churches, and and they are pastored by baby boomer pastors who will be retiring soon. So there's this big question mark on the mega church. I think the mega church will always be around, but I think over the next, my, if I were to speculate, I don't want to root against anybody, but if I were to speculate, I would say we're probably going to see another decline by half over the next 10 or 15 years. Wouldn't and be surprising, years, especially what we've seen on the smaller end. When we've seen the precipitous decline on the smaller end, I think the larger churches are going to have something that will match that very, very soon. So. Yeah, a lot of them grew through transfer growth, and when the median church size is down by half, uh, a lot of those people transfer. Nobody from, to transfer. <laughs> yeah, there's no no one left to transfer. Yeah. So you know, the, the, there's no more transfer growth left. Uh, that was a generational thing with the baby boomers. They moved out of smaller mainline churches and into larger, more conservative uh, mega churches. Again, you may not like that, but it's the facts. Those are the facts. You know, one of the good things about the baby boomers, and I'll, I will applaud my generation in this way, they tend to be good at volunteerism. They tend they, they tend to be the ones who step up and uh, get the work done. Uh, many of them have an activist mindset and a positive sense for the church. And I don't know what percentage of your church, and I'm just talking to anybody, not to you, Sam. I don't know what percentage of your, your church uh, has baby boomer volunteers, but it's possible that it might be a large number, a large percentage. And as a result, the baby boomers get dis are dis disabled. Uh, they die. You're going to have fewer volunteers that you depended on. Yeah, certainly. Um, I would have to sit down and crush the numbers at my church, but just thinking of just, you know, names and faces right now, um, I would say Gen X and baby boomers are our two of any generation. Those are our two most consistent volunteers. I don't, I don't know that we have a larger proportion because we're getting to be a really young church. About a third of our church is 18 and under. Um, but in terms of consistency, um, we really put Gen X and baby boomers to work and boy, they step up. Um, millennials really are rising to the occasion too. I, I, I'm very blessed to have a healthy church. I don't want to leave out my own generation, but I, I would say, I don't know about the proportion, but certainly what are the, who are the ones that we can count on to be there like every week? Yeah, a lot, a lot of them are baby boomers. And as the baby boomers leave, church staff positions will become harder to fill. Some of that's related to economics. Some of it is related to availability. It's already happening. I mean, uh, gosh, every week. Can you find us this person? Can you find us this person? Every single week. All the time. I get that all the time. I get those texts every week from friends, acquaintances, peers. I have a student pastor position open. I have a worship pastor position open. I need this. I need that. Does anybody know anyone? And inevitably, the replies are very similar. Yeah, I'll look around or I'll see what I can find or, hey, I'll, you know, I'll keep you in mind. <laughs> it's like there's the availability is very limited right now. Um, and from a church perspective, this is one of these dynamics we've talked about at Church Answers is this whole supply and demand thing with pastors and not just pastors, but just a lot of church staff positions. These churches have this ideal in their mind because a lot of them were led by baby boomers who actually did a pretty good job. And so they have this pastor in mind, you know, it's Pastor Tom, to use your name, Pastor Tom, but pa we, we envision Pastor Tom from 1988, and we want to go find Pastor Tom from 1988 again, and, but that, that guy does not exist. He doesn't no, he exist. Doesn't. No, he, he wasn't as good as you thought he was. But, but maybe, I mean, there may be a bit of revisionist history there, but perception is reality. And, and so a lot of these churches who mean well are like, have this ideal of a pastor from a bygone era, and they're trying to relive that. And the young people that they look at don't match that paradigm, so they're not interested in them. And they're just, those pastors that are available, and it's a very limited supply, uh, are not as appealing to churches that are looking. And so you get all these positions that are open and all these expectations of churches, and there's nobody to come in and fill those expectations. And they could hire somebody younger, 
that person may be willing to go, but you're going to have to change your church in order to bring them on. And a lot of people are not as willing to do that. Text today from one of our platinum, platinum clients. Hey, we're now looking for a student pastor. I've heard it's hard to find one. Now we found out that it's hard to find one. Please, if you have any recommendations, student pastors, please send me their resume now. Then I say to him, well, we'll get on it right away. And I say, who will look at it? Let me set expectations. It's the position which we get the most requests and for which we have the least success. Most established churches do not want to consider an internal hire, someone in their church, but that is where we're seeing the best results. I believe if you can shift your paradigm, you'd, you'd have good results. But we're ready to support you in any way you want. Most would-be student pastors moved to church planning a decade ago. Now they're moving to church revitalization, and there are fewer of them. The supply is woefully short. That's one example. Just but one example, and stay tuned because Church Answers will have a solution coming up soon for this problem. We are well aware of it, and we're on it like Blue Bonnet. What if you could replace a staff person for $100 a month? Oh, now you're trying to sell it. What if? We haven't even decided on the price point yet. We have. Okay. Well, we just did. No, we have. (laughs) I've, I've, I've already got our team members out there talking about it, so we have. And by the time this podcast airs, Sam, we will have already had some interest meetings on Zoom. So yes, I'm, really I'm, not, I'm, well I'm not. I'm, I'm not letting the cat out of the bag. The cat is I'm, already out. I'm well aware, and I'm excited about it. I'm just my church staff is coming to Church Answers, and it's coming you to go. your church. That's the, that's the name of the resource. My church staff. Excited. Real quickly, talk to us about neighborhood churches and mid-sized churches. That is your forte. They're the best position to fill this demographic reality. Finish us out with that, Sam. Yeah. So the nation's getting older. Uh, Mega churches are waning. The movement is waning. Um, People aren't driving as far. They don't want to drive as far to go to church. They don't drive as far to go to work. Um, Local is very in right now, as opposed to regional. Everyone's about their own neighborhood and what's going on in their little corner of the world. I think all of those are good things. Uh, And the, the one, the, the, the church that's best positioned to capture the moment is the neighborhood church. Now Mm -hmm. these neighborhood churches, they're just, people aren't just going to show up. You actually have to do the work to get them there. Uh, but you're in a very good demographic reality. The mobility rates of people are way, way down, especially among the younger generation. So if you want to get younger as a church, if you move now and act quickly and you start getting young people in your church, they're more inclined to stay because they can't afford to move. Millennials are not moving, which means they're staying put in their neighborhoods. So if you reach young people, you are more likely to keep them. And millennials in particular are drawn to the proximity factor, which is this church is right around me. I'm going to give it a shot. Um, but again, they're not. people aren't going to magically show up just because demographics change. You still have to do the work of the Great Commission. You still have to do the work of the Acts 1-8 imperative. You still have to go reach them. Uh, but I do think neighborhood churches and mid-sized churches are very well positioned to to capture the the demographic reality that is in front of us right now. The work is still necessary. Obedience is still called upon, but the opportunities are greater. This is your opportunity to reach people in your neighborhood. Hey, you want to know one way to do it? Upward sports. That is um, great. That is a great op. You want to talk about mid-sized churches, neighborhood churches, capturing the opportunity. Oh my Upward goodness. can be the way that you do that. Think think about some of the questions we get. How do we get younger? Well, have you ever thought about bringing Upward. sports to your church? Upward. How do I do outreach? Upward. Upward. Uh, how do I get families of the neighborhood mixing with families of the church? Upward. I mean, there's pretty much the answer for all of your outreach needs. There you go. And that they, they were relevant when they were started many, many years ago. I think they're at their most relevant point right now because they are truly the people that can help the neighborhood church, other churches as well, obviously, but the neighborhood church. And let me just remind you of this. You are listening or watching this on YouTube in the middle of October. Now is the time to plan with Upward. So if you want to get a basketball team, if you want to get a softball team, if you want to get a soccer team, whatever the team may be, Upward is a turnkey that can use whatever you have or don't have in your church, whether you do or don't have a gym, whether you do or don't have a field, whether you do or don't. That, they'll figure it out for you. They'll give you everything you need. They'll organize it for you. They'll tell you what to do. But don't wait till 2025 to do your 2025 league. And stop complaining about people going to sports events on Sunday. 
get the sporting events coming to your church on a regular basis, and they will start coming on Sunday. So get ready for 2025. You can, we'll, we'll leave the information in the show notes about how you can uh, connect to Upward, but now is the time to move forward. So Sam, good information, good stuff. Uh, I always enjoy talking generations and I enjoy talking about my generation, but this is a good one and it's a good wake up call while at the same time, it's a good opportunity. Well, we want to thank you for being a part of Rainer on leadership. Continue to watch us on YouTube. Hey, do you mind subscribing so we can get the word out or at the very least give us a thumbs up if you can do that. And then wherever you're listening to us on your favorite podcasting app, if you have time, give us a rating and review. If you don't have time, please give us a rating and review as well. We'll see you in the next episode of Rainer on Leadership.